He is the bassist, vocalist, pianist, producer, and songwriter for the Grammy Award-winning country band Rascal Flatts. Jade DeMarcus, it's so great to have you with us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You wrote your life story in this book, Shotgun Angels, and you were so transparent and honest about everything about your life, good, bad, and the ugly. How hard was it to just open it all up like that? It was really tough. I mean, you know, when you go and put yourself out there and talk about things that are painful and have to relive certain events, it's not always fun. But as I unpacked my life and sort of went through it, I felt compelled to tell certain things because even as I relived them, they were unbelievable to myself. And so I wrote it in the hopes that somebody else would be encouraged and inspired by my own personal journey and my own story. I was so amazed at how many people along the way really stepped up for you in, in hard times and helped you out. And it's so true that nobody gets to where they are in life without somebody helping them along the way. It was so inspiring. You talk about shotgun angels, people mm -hmm. along the way that God uses to help you out. Tell me what that means to you, shotgun angels. Well, exactly that. It's about the people and the angels that are around you riding next to you that you may not even know sometimes. And uh, for me, I had so many people to come into my life at huge turning points and, and defined seasons in my life where I needed somebody and I didn't even realize it to do something miraculous for me. And there are so many stories in there that people will probably shake their heads in, in disbelief that, like I said, are hard for me to relive and put them on paper because it sounds so extraordinary. But if we have faith, we believe in the impossible. We believe in the unseen. And I've had evidence of that in my entire life. So all of those people that I talk about in that book are my shotgun angels. I love that. And you know, it's funny how when we're going through it, we don't always see those people in our lives or we don't always see God at work. It's usually when we look back, you look back at your life and then you see, oh my gosh, God was working in ways I couldn't even imagine. Yeah. You know, even in the darkest times when I questioned my faith and I was as far away from my relationship with God as I could ever be, His hand was still on me. His hand was still guiding me. And that's probably one of the things that makes me the most emotional is because even though I had gotten to the point to where I had given up and questioned, he never gave up on me. And he never stopped loving me and keeping his hand on my life. Yeah. And I, that's what I love the most about the telling of all of those stories. I look at the huge open doors in your life, getting a full scholarship to Lee University with hardly even applying, just you know, a chance meeting. Um, and then you get the chance to go pro before you even graduated. Tell me about that time of your life. Yeah, well, it was a big time of indecision. I just graduated high school and my grandfather owned a glass company in Ohio. And so I figured that I was just going to go into the glass business, install windows and mirrors, and that was going to be my life. I had no money to go to college. And so lo and behold, there was a chance meeting that I had with Danny Murray, who is still a dear friend of mine and a great mentor to me. He offered me a scholarship to go to Lee if I played in his group that recruited for the school. and. That was my open door and my chance to go to college, and I jumped at it. My life was turned around inside of eight days. Uh, I had a different future mapped out before me in a small window of time. I tell that whole story in the book, and, it, and it's truly miraculous how that ended up happening to me. And that began a journey that I didn't even know at that time would ultimately bring me to Nashville into my first record deal at Benson Records. You formed the band East to West and had incredible success. Just kind of took off from zero to a, a hundred miles an hour overnight. Yeah, that was a crazy time. It was. It was a whirlwind experience. It really was. We went from being in school together to living in Nashville to doing a record and having a first single out, and it seems like it went by in a blur. And we were off and running, and everything was going great. And life happened. Things happened in relationships that really took me to one of the darkest places I'd, I'd ever been to in my life. And, you know, quite honestly, that was the time where I had to dig the deepest and really figure out what I believed and why I believed it. Mm, you met a girl, Claire. Yeah. I fell in love. She broke your heart. She did. First girl I'd ever been, like, open, completely open to um, loving with everything in me, you know. And the one, the first one that you love that way, I think if you, if it ends in a breakup, it hurts the most, you know. Yeah. And it certainly did for me. It was hard to bounce back from. I thought that we were destined to be together forever. And as it turns out, it wasn't meant to be. I couldn't see it at that point in time. I thought that, uh, it was one of those times where I thought, all right, Lord, I've, I see everything that you're laying out before me. I got it. This is going to be awesome. And no, it was not meant to be. It was hard for me to bounce back from that heartbreak. And it really sent me in a downward spiral for a few years. 
really. Yeah, you met another girl during that those dark days. Yeah. Weren't really in love. No. But was hanging out, you know, because it's it's a it's a lonely time after a breakout breakup, yeah. right? And you just cling to somebody. Mm -hmm. But you had one night with her. One night. Where yeah. you made a decision, and what happened? Well, we had been dating, and we decided to have sex, and and um, the one time we did have sex, the condom broke, and there was something inside of me that I just knew in that moment that she was pregnant. I don't know how I knew it, but I just had this gut sinking feeling that we were in trouble. And I freaked her out to the point to where she got up and left and didn't, didn't speak to me, didn't really want anything to do with me. And I, and I get it. I mean, I would have been freaked out too, I guess, if I were her. But sure enough, she called me about a month later and she was in fact pregnant. And we were both faced with this huge monumental decision and circumstance in our lives and it was so tough to figure out what the answer was yeah. and I don't think either one of us were at that young of an age prepared to deal with a situation like that and we talked briefly about getting married and raising her and we quickly decided that we weren't in love and didn't need to get married for the wrong reasons and abortion was not an option for either one of us and ultimately decided to place her in adoptive services and it was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make in my entire life. And one of the most painful times in my life to know that um, I was going to have a child that I may run the risk of never having no a relationship with her or not knowing her to any degree. And I felt like I needed to tell that story because it was such a catalyst to so many other events that unfolded in my life to get me to this point. And you never met your baby girl to this day, have you? Mm -mm. No, I want it. You know, quite honestly, uh, it's not that I don't want to. I'm open to having a re relationship with her, and I think about her every day, but I want it to be her decision. And I don't want to cause anything, any hurt to the family that she's with or anything like that. So I've, I've wanted to respect their privacy and really try to leave that uh, to her to decide. Man, the tough days, not just, you know, knowing that you're not going to see your daughter and living with that, but news of what happened got out, and it really just kiboshed your entire career, didn't it? Yeah, you know, in the Christian music industry, it's tough to bounce back from having a child out of wedlock. That's kind of a no-no. So it was, it was a big deal. You know, with Neil, my partner, I felt like I had let him down. I felt like I'd let myself down, and what I stood for at the time, uh, we just, there was a lot of guilt and shame that accompanied that. And, you know, the record label quickly dropped me, my management dropped me, and everybody just sort of scattered, you know. And it was one of those times you really find out who your real friends are. And I'm not going to say that I didn't have any true friends during that time. I, I did. There were people that stuck with me, Neil being right at the top of that list and loving me through that time. But it was a tremendous weight to carry around. Um, I take full responsibility for my actions, and I'm not trying to place blame, but... All too often I feel like Christians kill their wounded instead of nursing them back to health and trying to make sure that they're there to rebuild them up and they find their footing again. Yep. And so it was, it was a hurtful time and a dark, painful time for me. And, um, you know, I learned a lot, a whole lot, a hard way. I guess, you know, the church should be a hospital for the sick. That's really what we should be. Mm -hmm. But we're just so quick to judge sometimes. And it's, it's crazy that one minute everybody wanted a piece of you and everybody thought you were, like, amazing, and then the next minute, silence. Yeah. It's, it's tough to take. You work your whole life to get somewhere and do something, and it's gone in an instant. And that's what I felt like. I, you know, I considered giving up and moving back home to Ohio and kind of quitting the pursuit of a music career. Because I felt like that was it. I felt like I had been, been given it and wasn't a good steward of it and just sort of, you know, was very irresponsible and, and lost it all. So I had to do a lot of soul searching during that time and really figure out, you know, if I believed what I believed because my mom drug me off to church three or four times a week or if I really had a deep-rooted faith of my own that I could lean on. And I learned a lot about myself through that time. You connected at that time with Michael English, who suffered a similar experience. He had yeah. an affair. Very public. Very public, yeah. lost everything. You guys weren't necessarily the best influences on each other in, the, in that we time. We weren't, but we had a lot of fun. 
<laughs> uh, you know, I love Michael English dearly. He's one of my favorite people on the entire planet. And my time spent with him on stage, being in his band and making music with him, is still some of my most favorite musical memories, period, because very few people command the stage the way that he does. And it was an honor to spend that time with him, be with him. And we became very best of friends and very, very close. And uh, I'll always say that he was one of those shotgun angels that came along at one of my darkest times where I needed somebody that understood what I'd been through and could relate to my circumstances. And he was just that. He didn't judge me. He loved me. He brought me in and, and was a real friend to me and still is to this day. And I'll forever be great, grateful to him for that. It is amazing when you think that if you hadn't lost your career with East to West, you would never be doing what you are today and how in our life closed doors sometimes really are something that's trying to lead us to another open door. Yeah. Do you see it that way? I definitely see that and see it that way, but you, you can't see that when you're living in those, the moments of those hard times, you know, and I'm grateful for those things now and everything makes so much more sense now having lived through it and being on the backside of it. But yes, I definitely know now why I had to get from point A to point B to get to point C to get to point D, but it doesn't make it any easier when you're having to live through it in the no, moment. No, not at sure. all. And tell me about the, the choice between being a, a Christian band, Christians in a Christian band, and people of faith kind of in a more mainstream band. Or is, it, is there any difference? Well, yeah, there is difference. I feel like if you're a believer in a band that just does music, you're not going to be judged and, and set up on this pedestal that everybody's just waiting to knock you off of. You know, it just seems unfortunately that, that all too often that happens in Christian music. And I think Gary in particular had followed my career with East to West and saw what happened to me and he didn't want any part of it. <laughs> so we just wanted to go out and have fun and do the kinds of songs that would make people happy, touch their lives in some ways. And, um, you know, a pastor friend of mine says it the best. I love going to a Rascal Flats concert because you sneak the gospel in and people leave there having heard it and not even realizing it. And that for me is almost as important as anything else, you know, as being called a Christian band. I think we find ways because we all have similar values and belief system. I think that you can't help but let that message sneak into your art some way, and, and we've been able to do that. I've been to your concert, and there's been moments where it felt like church. Yeah. I was like, we're having church. This is crazy. I mean, we grew up, we all grew up in church, so somehow or another it's going to find its way into it, you know, and, and we love that. That's uh, one of the big pieces of who we are as people and as, as artists. So now you're, you're kind of coming out. You're talking a lot more publicly about your faith with this book. Are you worried that you're setting yourself up again on that pedestal? There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's already happened. It's like, you know, he's out there talking about what a great Christian he is. No, I'm not talking about what a great Christian I am. I'm talking about the fact that I am a Christian who has made mistakes and continues to make mistakes and recognizes that I need help because I'm a fallen person and I don't want to go through this life alone. I love the fact that I do have the kind of relationship that I can lean on in my faith with Christ that will get me through the darkest and most turbulent times. You know, you talk about your song, The Broken Road, and what it's meant to you, the, the pain you suffered, things we haven't touched on, the death of your grandfather, yeah. your father-in-law, the little girl that you haven't met, all of that. Tell me what you've learned about walking the broken road. Oh gosh, that it takes so many twists and turns you never see coming and never expect. But I also believe that with every twist and turn, there are places that you can find unbelievable strength and hope when you least expect it. And if you open up your heart and your mind enough to be receptive to it, you will be amazed at how many times hope can find you in the most strange and unlikely places. Mm -hmm. Because it certainly found me when I least expected it. You know, shame and regret, that can really hold us back from really living life. And I know that you have some things you regret. Talk to me about grace and have you been able to kind of shut shame up, I guess, in a sense, and really just live in the grace of God? Yes, it's tough because I'm human and you still beat yourself up when you're human. But one of the greatest lessons that I'm learning and that I love is that when you, when you hold yourself hostage over the, your past and the things that you've done, you put too many limitations on grace, which is a gift that none of us deserve in the first place. You can't do enough to merit the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And ironically, I was in a band whose name was taken from the scripture that he cast our sins is as far as the east is from the west into a sea of forgetfulness. Mm. So we're the only ones that hold on to our past. 
He lets it go and he forgets it. And all too often, we're too hard on ourselves, I believe, as human beings. Oh, yeah. Because all of us deal with pain and hurt. All of us deal with regret, disappointment. Uh, the good news is there's a way to get through it. And there's someone that can help you get through it. And that's the main thing that I want people to take away from this book. I'm not preaching to anybody that if you're not a Christian, you're going to hell and you should this and that and other. What I'm saying is there's been something that's helped me in my darkest times. And I hope that you're open enough to consider that it might be a source of strength for you in your own life. I have so enjoyed talking with you. Loved your book. Jay, thank you so much for visiting with us. I appreciate us. it. Thank you for your time. Thanks for checking out 100 Hotly Street. If you were inspired by the story you heard today, subscribe to our page and check out thousands of other life-changing stories we've shared.